So I took the mnemonic CABS, C-A-B-S, to refer to this hierarchy, but it's sort of in reverse. Cognitive, affective, behavioral, and somatic. So that's something you can remember, like taxi cabs. If the presenting problem is headache and dizziness and tired and pain and insomnia, that has to get addressed first. You can't put a building up without a foundation. If there's behavioral changes, there's, a, there's, there's erratic behavior, there's dangerous behavior, if the behavior is unstable, maybe the person had a drug abuse problem or they were an active alcoholic and then they had an injury. Maybe they already had damage to their brain before. If sleep is impaired, that has to be addressed first. A person doesn't present with a mild TBI and say, by the way, I usually drink a bottle of wine every night. I used to use cocaine and marijuana and I got kicked out of school and I'm not paying for child support. That's not what they say. They say, I got in this car accident, I might have a lawsuit going, and I can't remember anything. So often what's presented are the cognitive features first. But again, the cognitive features sit on top of an affective base. Affect refers to components of emotionality. It's not uncommon for a person that's had an injury to have changes in their mood. I had a patient that came in a month ago. He was seen for problems from an injury requiring neck surgery. His behavior was erratic. He was not motivated. He couldn't perform. And the first thing that he said to me very stoically was, I want you to know that I don't believe in you guys. I don't think that it's right that people take medicine. But by the way, I'm so depressed, I think my wife would be better off without me. I've been thinking about killing myself because I can't concentrate and go to work. In the course of helping this fella, first I tried to address his cognitive problem, which didn't work. So I had to reverse and go to his affective problem because there was a difference between what he reported and what he experienced. One week after going on medication, he wasn't aware of any change in his mood. But he was more outgoing, he was more spontaneous, and he was more talkative. There was a change in his emotional state. He hadn't, he hadn't been aware of it. The cognitive part, the distraction, the forgetfulness, the mental stamina, the ability to read, frequently those are areas that are overlooked. As I said earlier, people that have a mild traumatic brain injury that present with dizziness and headache and fatigue, in the course of a week or two or a month, by three months, 90% of people are better. But 10% of people still linger. Those are the people that need to be helped beyond just watchful waiting. So I mentioned some of the tests that have been ordered. There's another test called a P300 test, but I won't explain that to you. This fellow that I just told you about that had trouble with concentration and, and uh, had a neck uh, surgery, had obstructive sleep apnea, wasn't able to use a CPAP machine because of his neck and the surgery, he was going to have to be refitted or, or an oral appliance. Or, or if somebody hasn't been evaluated for sleep apnea and they're complaining of fatigue, then perhaps the fatigue is a result of multiple things, the brain injury and sleep apnea. In the office, I do some of the attention tests on my little computer that takes about 30 minutes, one of which I showed you already. And then at some point, I have to talk about a treatment plan. What's the, what's the symptom that's the first priority? And often the person that's the patient doesn't have the same priority as their spouse or partner. Well, thanks for staying with me for most of the talk. The part on the brain was interesting but highly detailed. The last part of the talk will involve treatment. How do we use medications? And what are some of the therapies that are used? What's meant by stimulant medications and memory pills? And you have to think about the different symptoms and how does a person approach the treatment? I'll include all of that and then I'll summarize and hopefully you'll be ready to take a test. Just kidding, there's no test. There's a role for medication and medication should be held accountable. It has to do something. People with a size 10 shoe wouldn't go out and buy a size 20 shoe or a size 5 shoe. It has to be customized. It has to be fluid. Medicine has to be fairly seamless. 
And in the beginning, most medicines have some side effects. They have, they have side effects. There's intestinal side effects, attention side effects, um, other sort of things. But those side effects shouldn't be considered in the same ballpark as an adverse reaction. If somebody's given a medicine to help them sleep, Ambien is, 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 is one of the medicines. An adverse reaction would be where your sleep is disrupted, you're waking up at night and you're eating, and you can't remember, and you're walking around. Or you develop a rash. So an adverse reaction shouldn't be the same thing as a side effect. And if a person has never been on medication, and I'm introducing medication, they're often thinking about a side effect as being the same as an adverse reaction. It's very important to get the person to maintain the distinction between day and night, to have a sleep rhythm, to address some kind of a schedule about their behavior, or their mood. So as these symptoms are looked at, we have to have a starting point. On this slide, I mentioned some medications that are used for different uh, complaints. That gets more into a talk to doctors. To my surprise, two medications have been helpful. On the bottom, for behavior, I wrote the medicine Lamotrigine. You've probably heard of Lamotrigine. It's known as Lamictal. It's an anticonvulsant. It's approved for partial complex seizures. It's been studied to look at bipolar depression. It seems to be well tolerated without cognitive side effects, even at low doses, and it seems to help erratic moods. Th that's, that's very interesting. It's something that's new. It doesn't usually have to be used at doses that would be used for the other conditions. Also, to my surprise, is the medicine Seroquel. Um, if I approach the complaint of sleep, meaning insomnia, tired but inability to fall asleep, the analogy in my mind is like looking into a, a well or a pond or an ocean. It's very difficult to evaluate just from looking how deep that water really is, meaning that the medicine that's used to help insomnia would be medicine that I would conceptualize as addressing towards the surface because there's fewer side effects. Seroquel is a medicine that works at a much, much deeper level. It's approved for bipolar depression. It's approved for schizophrenia. And in lower doses, it's very sedating. It helps the brain to relax while it's sleeping. But for a person that's never been on a medication, to introduce that right off the bat, that's not a first choice. And I can't determine. I simply don't know how difficult that person's sleep problem is. But to my surprise, with two patients in the last, say, four months, that's been a very good medication. That's certainly not something that's used right off the bat. Uh, 